Hello and welcome to the shop. Just getting back into the rhythm of things. We've got a fairly quick and easy project this week. It's something that I think all of us, anybody who, just, who uh, has a lathe and does wood turning, can do, can have fun with, and can maybe make you a little bit of money. What am I talking about? Cannon jar lids. This is a friction fit ring in a turned lid. It's very, very beautiful. It's very attractive. I was walking through the grocery store the other day and saw these wonderful canning flutes. They're quaint flutes from Ball. And, and I just I just saw that and said, that's a project. That's something fun to do. You can add a little texture, a little burning. There's all kinds of ways that you can just really have fun and be creative. But it's also quick. It's very simple. It takes some basic technique, but it's not very complex to do. So I have a uh, sapele here. I've got two made of sapele, one of Spanish cedar. And while I was making the fourth one, uh, the Spanish cedar lid cracked because it was just a little bit thin. So I figured, you know, I can not only salvage the project because it didn't damage the ring at all, the wood crack, this is a friction fit. I, so I you know, thought not only can I salvage the project, but I can go ahead and make a YouTube video and share it with you. I've got this wonderful piece of walnut. This came from my friend Chris at Yellow Dog Woodworking in Ohio. And uh, he sent me a box with some cutoffs and ends, and it included just some wonderful, really nicely grained walnut. So we're gonna put this piece of walnut to use. Um, the only thing you need is rings. You don't have to buy jars. I just saw these jars, thought they were ideal, and I think in marketing these, say at a craft fair, or a Saturday market, having the jar as part of the package will sell the product. I'm actually going to put all four back in the box and try to sell them as a whole. Just a suggestion, you can do this however you want. Also, if you have your own garden and you do your own canning, when you give away jars of jam or jelly that you can, why not give it away in this wonderful decorative lid? This will get reused and reused. These are friction fit. So if something damages the ring and your your uh, recipient is, is determined enough, because it is a good tight friction fit, they can actually get it off using the jar as leverage and put a fresh ring in. Usually though, this one, you would can with the lid and a plain ring, take the plain ring off, put this ring on with the, uh, with the fun lid, and then there you give it away as a gift once it's cooled and everything like that. Again, this is just a suggestion. It's a fun little project. It gives you something where you can practice your skills, uh, both if you wanted to turn end grain, you could do it end grain and cross grain. So it gives you some gouge skills, some scraper skills, some texturing skills and practice. And really, the possibilities for how you're going to do this are endless. So stick around. We're going to try to make this a quick one. Let's put some lids on jars. So for preparing this project, uh, it's best to just cut little squares. Um, it doesn't really matter how thick the blank is, but it's nice if you have it as close to being square as possible. Uh, I like to start this between centers. There are other ways to do it. You could just glue it on a waste block and make it round. Um, that works for me. Turning it between centers is probably the, uh, the best way to start the project. So what I like to do is mark my centers on each side and I will punch them. I uh, use a stab center, which has a nice flat ring, so that helps keep this parallel, so I don't really have to worry about too much wobble. It may wobble a little, but I'll fix that. And what I'm gonna do is turn a tenon on it, and then uh, flip it and hollow the lid side. So when I do this, what I also like to do is trace the ring I get it as close to center as possible, but I like to trace it. So as I'm turning this round between centers before I establish my tenon, I have a uh, no-go line. I have, I have something to aim for where I do not, under any circumstances, want to cross that line because if I do, I'll make this too small and it won't hold the lid. So this, again, this is not a definitive ring. This is just don't get too thin. Basically, I want to get this just to round and then I'll worry about hollowing and fit afterwards. 
but if I get too close to this line, this isn't going to be useful. It'll crack when I shove this in there, so I need to make sure that I give myself a limit. Keep the ring around. These aluminum rings are as close to identical as possible, but they're not identical. They're stamped, and there's going to be a little bit of variation in each, so I highly recommend that you keep the ring that you're going to put in each lid with the lid, and you shape and, and uh, hollow and make a recess that fits each individual lid. That's the only time-consuming part of this project is it's not a spe it's not quite universal. You can't just do one size fits all because there are small variations in the aluminum just like with aluminum cans. So for this to work the best, it's best to keep each ring individually and size it individually. It's not very time consuming. It sounds like a big deal, but it really isn't. For this project, I highly recommend that you have a set of vernier calipers. These are invaluable. Another very useful tool is a depth gauge. You can actually use the other end of your vernier caliper as a depth gauge if you don't have one. These are available at Harbor Freight in a kit with an inside diameter, outside diameter, uh, and a uh, compass. So, I, and it's cheap, it's like five bucks. It's a really useful, useful tool. So I really recommend that you do get one of these. Um, they're also pretty tough. This actually managed to get swept up and thrown in my burn barrel and burned and still works just fine uh, Even though it went through the full process because I couldn't find it because I dropped it in the in the sawdust pot So I really highly recommend a depth gauge uh, again. You can get this kit at Harbor Freight It's very inexpensive and this is an infinitely useful tool. You can also make your own depth gauge Okay, I've got it round now my circle that I drew that's my do not pass go line is on the inside because I'm putting a tenon on the outside and I wanted to make sure I kept that where I can see it so that I don't accidentally get myself too far and turn that away and I can't I can't uh, you know I can't see where I'm gonna go past and ruin the project so a quick tip um, if you're using Novichok if you're using the two inch jaws roughly you set your pencil on top of your 60 degree live center. That is roughly the size of the tenon. You can go a little bit smaller, just a little bit smaller, but that's basically the size of your tenon. So that's a good guideline. If you're not used to turning a tenon for that Novichuk, that will get you where you need to go. Um, it's not exact, but it's close enough for government work. Okay, here to set your recess that your ring will go in, you have a lot of different options. First of all, at this point, like I said, this is a drop dead line. This is not the finite line. So the first thing I need to do is find the actual width that I need this piece, this, this uh, recess to be. So I'm going to come in with my vernier calipers and I'm going to measure just under this little lip because I want this lip to be underneath the wood like that that's going to stop from pushing the wood too far on so I want to measure the width right here and these have these have a slight uh, slightly wider shape at the base I want to take that into consideration because this wants to be a jam fit wants to be fairly tight so that widest width I want it to be just barely able to pass the caliper just like that it's scraping that's what I want because again this is a jam fit now I'm going to hold this edge and slow the lathe down I'm going to hold this edge to the wood 
to draw my circle and that's not smooth, that's not flat, so first let's flatten that face. Clear away that pencil circle so that I have a fresh start. That's flat enough. So I'm just gonna touch with that side. I'm a little bit wide. There we go. That's my width for my recess. Now, just like with a lid for a lidded box, I'm not just gonna go gung-ho and tear that down. I'm gonna work my way out to it, and I can use several different tools to do that. Probably the easiest is just a parting tool. This is a uh, Robert Sorby, one quarter inch. Works very, very well for this purpose. It's just essentially like a negative rate scraper. As you can see, that just eats that stuff right up. Makes the test pretty simple and fairly quick. I'm not gonna go quite to that line. I've got myself some reserve space. You can also kind of use this a little bit like a very, very short skew chisel. Okay, at this point, I'm going to use my second measuring tool. That is my depth gauge. Remember, I want that lip to rest against the wood. So I'm going to set my depth gauge on top of that. And you can see there's a little bit of a rise here, so I'm going to get it up over that as well. And this is going to be the depth of my recess. It's tiny bit over a quarter of a, over a half an inch there uh, 164th over maybe a 32nd it can be a little bit deeper again this rim catching that's that's the uh, kind of the trick to this is this rim catching so we can make it a little bit deeper and I see they're not quite level here so I'm going to clean that up at this point it doesn't matter if I lose this line because I'm slowly going to creep out to that anyway so I'll clean this face up and get this depth, I'm about halfway there. I'm not worried about losing that line. At this point, depth is most important. Also, I am looking down over the shaft of the tool and aligning it with the bedways of the lathe to make sure that it is parallel so that I have a perfectly perpendicular recess or as close as I can get it as a human being since this is not a machine holding the tool and getting it it's not going to be mechanically perfect but I'm going to get it as darn close as I can Check our depth. Right now we're just worried about depth and I've still got a little ways to go. About five millimeters. Yeah, we're a tiny, tiny bit more to go. So another thing you can use uh, is your uh, skew, again, as a negative rate scraper. That works. I have also made myself, out of a round nose scraper, I squared off the ends and made myself a box scraper. The negative rate. 
that works as well to smooth out that inside surface. You want a nice smooth surface, you don't have to worry necessarily about finishing that surface. It's not something that's going to be seen by the customer. Or at least not regularly. All right, I have just a hair further to go. Okay, we're right at the depth. I'll take a tiny bit more out. We have plenty of room on the outside for the shape of the piece. I'm going to go back to my parting tool. And now we're going to start fitting the ring. Okay, so as you can see, it's undersized, which is what we want. We want to sneak up on this. It's very, very close. So I'm going to shave just a hair, again, lining up the shaft of the tool with the bedways of the lathe and make sure it's parallel. Now one thing I will warn you about when you're using a parting tool to do this is that the width of the tool can interfere with the angle of the circle as you're going in and can actually kick the tool out and make it wider at the base because the tool's getting shoved minutely just just little tiny increments but it's getting shoved out so you have to kind of pull that tool against that wall and prevent that from kicking out and therefore making the bottom narrower than the top because it's pushing the tool inwards so that's something to keep be mindful of you can avoid that by using your skew chisel standing it up and just getting that little edge in there and you can avoid it that way the problem with that is you've got this very tiny surface that you want to line up parallel to the bedways of the lathe and you've got far more leverage to really throw that off and not get as straight a cut as you might with the parting tool as long as you're aware that it's going to kick the parting tool out you can counteract it pretty pretty easily just like that Okay, so we're still too small, which is good. Like I said, we need to sneak up on this, and this might take three or four passes. It could take five or six passes. This is critical because this is a jam fit. You could glue these in, but I always want to, with this, because canning is involved, I want the customer to have the option to replace the ring if need be, which is why I jam fit these. Alright, we're much closer. We can kind of get a little bit of a friction rub. Can't really see it. We're going to take another bite. Okay. Now at this point, we can start really fine tuning it. And this is the point where it's important why I suggest you use each individual ring. You don't just do a generic, this is the right size, one size fits all, because there is variance in each individual ring. Okay, I overshot it. So it's too loose. So in this case, I will epoxy this in because it is ultimately, it's not the end of the world if this happens. You can epoxy it in. This 
Decorative lid should never be part of the actual canning process. This is put on after the canning is done. So I'm going to call that good. I did overshoot it. I got a little zealous, and that's okay. It's, it's salvageable. It's definitely salvageable. So what we're going to work on here is I'm going to give a little bit more depth there so that it rests firmly on this lip right here on the ring. So I'm going to take a little bit more out. We're going to clean up this edge, and then I'm going to just hit this inside with 220 grit sandpaper. Again, this is not a surface that should be generally, that is generally viewable. It shouldn't get wet, anything like that. This would get on, put on after the canning process. So it's really up to you if you want to take the time to finish in here or not. I don't find it's necessary to put finish on in here. the inside done now I have a jam chuck already prepared because I did make some of these so I've just got this little piece of pecan left over from another project and this is a little loose I might have to put a paper towel in there Yep, we're going to have to use a, a little bit of a technique here. I learned this from Cindy Dro uh, Drozda. Droz Drozda. You actually split the paper towel. These are two plies. Separate the plies. And if that doesn't give you enough of a jam, that was a little loose. We'll go over the two plies. That's still too loose, which is okay. Let's go three plies. You can get a very fine adjustment there. We can actually jam all four plies. When we fold it in half, it's two plies. When we fold it in half, it's four. That should be enough friction to hold it with light passes. I am going to bring my tailstock back into play just until I get to the center. And that will help make sure that I keep it on while I'm getting the shape and everything going on the outside. So. Painter's tape. If you can hold it, you can turn it. If you made it too loose, you can either make it out jam chuck, which is hit or miss, or you can just adapt. And very, very light. I'm not, I'm not trying to dig away at this. I want a little bit of texture here, a little bit of shape. Now I'm going to give myself some... To increase the interest, we're going to take this machinist's knurling tool. This is not a wood turning tool, this is a machinist's tool, but it works really good. Let's take a look at that. Oh, that looks really nice. I like that. I like that a lot. Just give it a little character, a little interest. Now, to help delineate it and break that apart, set that apart, I'm going to take a piece of thin wood, just a little cut off, and I'm going to friction burn in those creases. And it's okay if I do that. It's 
I'm going to sand. I just need to get in there. Get enough friction. Now I'll sand the excess away. There we go. So that gives us some interest, a little accent, and now we're going to sand. So we slow the lathe down. At this point, we're going to take our tape off because we do have to sand all the way around. But the lathe's going to be moving slower, and we will be using light touch. Take that little edge, soften it. <laughs> All right, so at this point, we're just going to hit it with the 320. We're going to knock down that raised green, smooth it out a little bit, and then we're going to go to Brad's workbench abrasive paste. Okay, so I use uh, Tay Tools, uh, 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 Bob Smith Industries, actually, BSI, Bob Smith Industries, two part slow cure epoxy from Tay Tools. This stuff is amazing. It's inexpensive, and what I like the most about it is, unlike other brands, it doesn't smell hideous. Uh, I also have some Gorilla Glue, and it's great epoxy, but it smells awful. This stuff, although the smell is there, it's not overwhelmingly strong. This is a very nice epoxy. It has a 30-minute open time, which means you can wipe it off, you can change your mind, you can move stuff around. I, I would assume you could probably put mica powder, put color in there if you wanted to. Uh, I don't. Th there's no reason on this project, but uh, I also have seen a lot of knife makers use this particular two-part epoxy for uh, gluing scales. Right, I'm just going to give it a good layer. Try to prevent that. I want everything up towards the top because it's going to kind of push downward as I push it on. So this is just another option and the only reason I'm doing this is because I overshot my jam. And so what I'm showing you is that that's not the end of the world. You can still salvage it. There are ways. You don't have to use this brand of epoxy. It just is a good brand. I really like it. Um, I, like I said, I've also got Gorilla Glue. I don't like the smell. This stuff doesn't smell like that, but when I'm in a pinch and I'm out of BSI Industries epoxy, I'll break out the Gorilla Glue. Okay. Let me grab a paper towel. I probably should have put my nitrile gloves on. I'm so used to being out of them that I forgot I have them. I do recommend you wear some nitrile or if, latex if you can wear latex. We have allergies in our house, so we buy nitrile. I'm not allergic, but everybody needs gloves once in a while, so let's get the ones that are allergen free. Clean that up. Okay, this has, like I said, a half an hour open time. So I'm simply just going to leave it here. Now, what I was saying about my finish is I've been using Brad's Workbench Tongue Honey. And that is literally a wipe-on. Let it soak in. You can put multiple coats if you want. Uh, and then after at least a half an hour, while the tongue oil begins to polymerize, you just uh, let it set, walk away from it, go work on another project, and then simply buff it off with a paper towel or the white um, 3M pads work really well and you end up with a really nice result like this. Like I said, a great little project. You can probably turn half a dozen of these per hour if you wanted to make a couple dozen for a Saturday market. Uh, you can just sell the lids and rings or my suggestion would be keep the packaging, 
Might take the top off because it's not going to fit exactly. But keep the packaging and sell these as a set. With the original packaging, just take the top off, I guess. But uh, I, I think, let's say $12 a piece or $15 a piece, you get this nice custom lid. The customer gets a jar that fits it. Hopefully, if they're canning, they have rings. And uh, it's just an appealing little project. So there you have it. This is gluing up. It will get finished. But uh, there's a walnut. We've got uh, two out of Sapele and one from Spanish Cedar. Thanks for joining me. I uh, hope this was a fun little project for you. And remember, just one more pass means put the bull gouge down.